You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Dr. Erin Elliott. Uh, she's part of the American Sleep and Breathing Academy. She's also owner and partner at the Post Falls Family Dental and Sleep Sleep Better uh, Center. Uh, she travels and lectures on sleep apnea and other sleep-related issues, and uh, sounds like she'll have quite a lot of great things to say. So, uh, Dr. Elliott, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, tell me about um, why why the interest in this area of uh, of health. Usually people have a, a backstory that leads them to do something like this. Yeah, that's what, that's what I call starting with why. And mm. essentially, I've been a general dentist uh, in, at Post Falls Family Dental for 16 years. And that is located in North Idaho, the Coeur d'Alene area, which is really a beautiful part of our country. And um, about 10 years ago, I discovered that dentists could be part of a patient's journey for a better night's sleep. And so I set out to learn as much as I could. And, and 10 years ago, it was still, you know, in, in its infancy of dentists being involved. But what I realized is who better to look at the signs and symptoms uh, because bruxing of the teeth, large tongue, small airways, those are things that we look at each and every day. So who better to screen patients, to talk to patients? And more importantly, we have a way to help treat uh, snoring and sleep apnea in a dental setting instead of that CPAP mask, we provide what's called an oral appliance. And so I have set out to spread that message in my community to people that don't know that sleep apnea is not an old fat man's disease. I set out in the community to speak to physicians about it, as well as other dentists across the country. Well, when you see uh, I mean, the average dentist, I mean, I haven't been to every dentist on earth, obviously, but you know, the few I've been to, I've never heard them mention anything about apnea. So is this is this a more recent phenomenon that's now on the radar of dentists when before it wasn't and just tooth cleaning? Yeah, like, how's the yeah, like I said, 10 years ago when I started, patients would look at me like I had two heads when I asked them how they slept, you know. And um, what it be, I think it's becoming, there's a greater awareness among patients and the consumer for example, like the advent of Fitbits and um, Apple Watches, you know, they are measuring sleep and people are realizing that sleep is an important component of overall health. But as far as the dentist talking to to them about it, I think they see the connection between grinding of the teeth, acid reflux, um, just anatomical issues. And so when I bring it up now, I think they kind of realize and then as far as in the dental landscape, um, you know, even though I've been talking about it for 10 years, there is a greater awareness among dentists. It's in our journals. It's in our CE. It's at our conferences. And uh, going back to your original question, I, I kind of forgot to talk about my why. Um, sure. I love to sleep so much, in fact, that I can sleep anywhere. I, I don't have sleep apnea. Um, but I do snore from time to time, and my husband loves to take selfies with me and post them all over social media. So I'm kind of known <laughs> Why you're for sleeping? my yes, I'm kind of known for my joy of sleeping, and also Boy, my lucky dad. Still married to you. Yes, well, you know, I don't look that beautiful, but our entire relationship was started on prank war, so I get him back. Don't worry, I get him back, but I I, I don't back. mind poking a little fun at myself. But, you know, more more seriously, my, my dad is a dentist, and uh, he came to the course with me just because he loves 
to learn. And he was my first patient. Come to find out his snoring was actually moderate to severe sleep apnea. He has all the classic dental signs and symptoms and health signs and symptoms. And we, for so long, just thought, oh, that's just what he does. He just snores. Oh, it's so annoying. Let's let's make yeah. light of it and make a joke about it. But it was much more serious than we ever considered. His heart, his average heart rate when he slept was 89 beats per minute. And resting heart rate is 60. It should. His heart was working overtime. And so we were able to get him um, diagnosed and treated, and it made a world of difference, not only for him, but my mom. And, you know, basically what my dad said was that I didn't know how tired I was until I wasn't tired anymore. Like it had been such a slow progression, such a part of his life that he forgot what a good night's sleep was. It was his norm. Yeah. His dad. Huh. I was going to ask you why you're aware of sleep apnea when, uh, well, what made you aware of it? But I guess it was that personal experience with your dad. Yeah. And and then once you catch the bug where you really help change someone's life, um, you know, my mom was sleeping better too. Like her life changed because of, of treating my dad because her, his snoring wasn't waking her up anymore and her insomnia was magically healed. And, you know, you can get a lot of satisfaction from helping someone smile again or getting them out of pain. But giving someone their life back is is what keeps me going. Yeah, I've, I know a lot of couples that, uh, you know, I've been, this is offline type talk, but uh, I've been doing some, you know, a lot of interviews in the sleep world and talking to people about it. Um, and I've heard, you know, a lot of friends of mine, they don't sleep in the same bedroom. They don't tell you at first, but they don't because, you know, one or both of them snore and keep the other ones up. So it affects a lot of relationships. I'm sure even if you don't have apnea, just the snoring does, you know. Yeah, and and most snoring is apnea. Uh, it's just that there's not an awareness because as soon as you say sleep apnea, it's like this wall gets de of defense gets put up because you know if you were to close your eyes, if I told you to imagine a sleep apneic, you think old fat man. And I treat petite, right. middle-aged women. I treat young, healthy, fit athletes that anatomically their airway is small, their airway collapses at night. And snoring is just one of the symptoms. You don't have to have snoring to have um, apnea. In fact, most middle-aged women, their main symptom is not snoring, but it's insomnia. And so that's why I love what we do, because um, as common as sleep apnea is, it is one in four men, one in 10 women, 50% of the age, 50% uh, of the population over the age of 50 and the wow. incidence becomes equal in men and women at menopausal age. So it's so common, yet 80 to 90% of them remain undiagnosed. And that's because yeah. if someone comes in with symptoms of insomnia, they get given a sleeping pill. If they come in complaining of, of um, fatigue, they check their thyroid, they check hormones, or if they have high blood pressure, which is a direct cause of sleep apnea, they get given a pill. And, and so we get to be more on the front lines. Um, dentists see patients more and more often. We have, you know, the hygienists have an entire hour with the patient in which they are staring at the airway. So my whole team is trained to identify these symptoms. We have their health history at our fingertips. So if we see that they're taking melatonin over the counter, which I think is the worst sleep aid in the world that people take because it's natural. Um, or if they um, are on high blood pressure medications, acid reflux medications, all of these things are a direct cause of sleep apnea. So we like to look at the uh, the whole view. What, why is this young person having AFib or um, hypertension? So that's why I love this job too, because, you know, we really can connect the dots for patients and bring it up, which in which they've been passed under the radar for years. And it was their dentist that finally was able to get to the root of it. Well, it's, you know, I've, I've heard from many people about the classic signs of sleep apnea. I'd like to hear about the more subtle ones. So what you said yeah. there's some dental uh, effects where you can tell possibly or signs of sleep apnea. So yeah, as a dentist, what will the dentist see that would signal them that there's possibly sleep apnea or snoring? Yeah, so we, um, at my office, we, for a small town, we're actually pretty high tech. So we take a cone beam or 3D images of our patients, 
And in that, we can volumize the airway and see um, sinus and nasal obstruction. So that's one thing that we look at. So we can see if they have a narrow airway three-dimensionally. But most importantly, if we see a recessed chin, you know, the, the way that we look at it anatomically is that all the muscles of the tongue and throat attach to that lower jaw, just behind your chin um, underneath there. And if that chin is further back than where it's supposed to be because of the jaws misaligned or how it grows in development or genetically, then that's one sign. Uh, another is, you know, as they were teenagers, they had crowding. And so the orthodontist pulled teeth that constricts the arches. So anything that impinges on the space for the tongue can be um, contribute to sleep apnea issues because it's the collapsing of the tongue, the collapsing of the airway that really is the obstruction of sleep apnea. So if we see a large uh, tongue, go ahead. Well, yeah, before we get to that, what, why would taking, what? so if the orthodontist takes out teeth, what happens in the mouth? What shifts and why does that cause, uh, you know, higher predisposition yeah. towards apnea? So if they have crowding, um, you know, as we grow and develop, we actually are supposed to grow forward and out, expand outward. Well, if there's crowding back in the old days, instead of using physics and, and braces and, and different um, techniques to, to, to encourage the growth outward and, and forward, uh, they would pull teeth and retract everything back. So even though the teeth are now straight because they had to make room for it, they kind of pulled everything back in order to line it up. And so anything that impinges on tongue space, so that constricts the arches, that constricts the amount of space that the tongue has, rather than forward and out, it's kind of backwards and in. And so that impinges on the tongue. And the, the things that we can see on the tongue are something that's called scalloped tongue. So if the patient opens their mouth, you can see um, scalloping along the sides. That's about 70, if you see scalloped tongue, that's 70% predictive of sleep apnea. And what the scalloping shows, it's just little indentations or ripples along the side of the tongue. That tells us that there's not enough room for the tongue. So it takes on the indentations of the teeth. If you stick your tongue out, oftentimes the scalloping goes away. So that's why I say you look um, when the patient opens. If the tongue retracts back, that's a sign. If there's a deep fold within the tongue, that's a sign. And, you know, as it, if the airway collapses um, and the patient is making an effort to breathe. So if you ever see a video of someone with a sleep apneic event, it, it can be scary, but you'll see them. I saw try it's to horrible. Breathe. Yeah, try to breathe. Try to breathe, but can't. Try to breathe, but can't. Because something is blocking the way, and it's usually the tongue. So that creates almost like a vacuum effect. And the uh, acid from the stomach can be pulled like almost a vacuum into the esophagus. In addition, our, our stomach muscles, our, our diaphragm is contracting. It's working hard to, to try to get the breathing going again. And so it pushes acid into the esophagus. And we can see acid erosion in the teeth. So that's another big sign. Also, what we've been researching and discovering as dentists is that 80% of grinding and bruxing um, events or clenching events is actually the body's way of subconsciously opening the airway and getting oxygen to the vital organs and brain. So when you clench or grind, that helps pull the jaw forward and op braces open the airway so that it's actually bigger than it, it is at rest. And so when our body's doing so, that at night... So someone sleeping does that in an attempt to open their airway? Yes. Yeah, so that's subconsciously the body is opening the airway to get oxygen. And so that's why we look for those signs and symptoms as well. So um, scalloped tongue, bruxing, acid erosion are three of the big ones. And then we can more subtle symptoms of a small swollen airway, um, what we call a battered uvula, you know, that little thing that hangs down. If that's really swollen and beat up, um, that's another sign that there's a narrowing of the airway, that there's a compromise in the airway. So we can see quite a bit. Um, just as we're working on patients. Oh, no, it's a gag reflex is another sign. What about um, the pattern of uh, staining or, uh, you know, biofilm or plaque accumulation? Does that change? If someone, you know, has asthma or apnea, I would guess that they breathe through their mouth far more than other people. So do, does that create a different pattern of plaque or decay in the mouth? 
That is a great observation, my friend. Yes. So um, gingivitis on the upper front teeth um, is a sign of mouth breathing. And yes, uh, saliva really is the best mouthwash we have. And if um, you're mouth breathing, you don't get filtered air and you, you get plaque that doesn't clean off. And so, yeah, someone who builds up a lot of tartar um, and stain, we have a lot of extrinsic reasons for staying as much uh, wine and coffee and things like that that we drink in this country. But the only reason it stains is if there's plaque there and it is much harder to get plaque off without if you're mouth breathing which tells us there's an obstruction somewhere. Yeah, I wonder if there would eventually be a test where you could just swab the mouth and culture it and see if the microbiome is, is more akin to a mouth breather versus a nose breather. Maybe in the future, that'll be like a, a test that can be done. Yeah. To, well, know, we already have, um, I do DNA swabs um, in, in my office or in my practice, and we can evaluate the bacteria and see how prone they are to heart disease and stroke. Um, so there's a lot of cool preventative things that we do as, as in the dental office. You know, it's the weird thing, though, is, I mean, I would guess a lot of people think of a dentist as just teeth. So when you talk yeah. to patients about all these other areas, do they react? And can you see it where they're, are they hesitant, thinking like you're not a traditional doctor or a sleep doctor? Do they, or do they welcome and, and get into this with you and listen and comply and do what they need to do? There's a mix of both. Um, I certainly had more of an uphill um, battle before, but I think there is just amongst the general public more of an awareness because of podcasts like this, um, because of, you know, locally I get out in the health journals and the newspaper and um, really any opportunity to spread the word that the mouth is connected to the whole body. Uh, I think I think that it's not as weird as it used to be. I think people know that dentists are more than just tooth mechanics. And there is, I think there's more awareness of the connection between heart and oral health um, now uh, than sleep and oral health, but we're working on that, on the sleep part of creating an awareness that the dentist can help. Also, you can probably hear my passion and, and expertise in the area. So I think when once I get the conversation going, I don't I don't tend to lecture or over educate my patients. I, I really try to listen get ask questions to get them talking. And as soon as we start discussing, I I think they see, okay, I think she could probably help me. And I do work with physicians. I work with their physicians. It's more of I become the quarterback because so many people the first the hardest part is admitting that you might have a problem. And then the second part is, okay, I have a problem. Now what, where do I go? Who do I talk to? My, my doctor said, Oh, you're, you don't have sleep apnea and you're fine. So now what do I do? And so I can help the people get to where they need to get, get through the steps, get metal medical insurance to help them and, and, and get through the proper pathway. So that's, that's what's so fun about it is that um, you get to help so many people that they didn't even know that was their issue. Yeah, you know how they have ENTs, ear, nose, and throat doctors? They should rename dentists to be like MTAs, mouth, tongue, and airway doctors. And maybe that would be a paradigm shift in people's minds. You know? You're on to something. Yeah, maybe that would be a new designation. Who knows? So, um, okay. What, um, no, yeah. You want to ask you about the treatment options? Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to head into now. Is so, okay. you know, you know, why is it part of that? Um, so you mentioned that uh, it seems like you don't like. CPAP, so you don't, maybe you don't believe that they're as uh, effective as, uh, you know, an oral appliance. So what are some of the treatment options you focus on, and how do you compare them to, you know, CPAPs and uh, other types of treatments? Um, so essentially, I I love CPAPs. I think they are are good. Um, you know, they didn't get in, they didn't get discovered or invented until late '80s, and before that, we had no treatment options except doing a tracheotomy and just bypassing the airway altogether. And so CPAP has helped a lot of people and saved a lot of lives. Uh, it essentially is a reverse vacuum. So it, it just keeps blowing air until the airway is open. And the problem is it just keeps blowing air until the airway is open. And oftentimes those pressures are very difficult. It's very difficult to um, become tolerant to. Uh, some people take to it right away. Some people work at it. 
But when someone's on a CPAP, I don't disparage them. I don't, I, I like CPAP. However, what a lot of people aren't told is that an oral appliance is a treatment option. And it is uh, found to be with research and science with thousands of patients that in mild to moderate cases of sleep apnea, oral appliance and CPAP are equally effective. What an oral appliance does is it essentially fits the top and the bottom teeth. And even if you don't have teeth, I've made them on dentures before, and it postures the jaw forward. Just like in CPR, the ABCs of CPR, in order to get an airway, you bring the jaw down and forward. So it essentially prevents the collapsing of the tongue, it increases muscle tone, and it, it braces that airway open. Um, and it works even in severe cases. Uh, especially if the patient is CPAP intolerant. In addition, we can sometimes, uh, like I said, the CPAP just keeps blowing air until the airway is open. It doesn't, it doesn't distinguish if it's, the pressure is tolerable or not. But if we can move some of the soft tissue out of the way with an appliance, then the CPAP doesn't have to blow as much air or work as hard, and so we can bring the pressures down. So there's times that we have patients wear both. So that um, if the appliance isn't effective enough, we can add the CPAP and it becomes much more tolerable. Um, also, finally, there is surgical options. And it, those were very popular in the 90s and was mostly marketed as anti-snoring. So the problem was it, it doesn't treat the actual apnea many times. So it can make a patient quieter but they're not cured from the apnea because the, they would, if they cut out the soft palate and the uvula and part of the throat, it, it takes away the vibration of soft tissue, which is snoring, but the tongue is still collapsing and causing apnea. So it's only about 30% successful. Then we call it the rotor rooter of the, of the mouth. And ENTs really are reluctant to really do it nowadays because of uh, the lower success rate. The best surgery that is the most successful is bringing the upper and the lower jaw forward together about um, a centimeter, about 10 millimeters forward. And that is very successful. But that's also a big step to take um, in order to do so. So an appliance in, in CPAP is an easy place to start. And if you want to make it permanent, then that, that we would look at surgical options. Huh, that's crazy. What's... Um... So with the oral appliance, it's it's advancing your lower jaw. It's pulling it forward. Does that lead to TMJ or other, you know, problems in the jaw, other tensions? I mean, it must be a, a getting used to period. And, and, you know, how does it affect people initially and then later on? Yeah, you would think so. But um, that's why it's so important to not use like an over-the-counter or an Internet version. Uh, also, it's very important not to use one that's fixed in place. So a custom oral appliance that is adjustable is very important. And again, it is a dental solution to a medical problem. So we get medical insurance coverage, uh, Medicare, and pretty much all uh, medical insurances cover the code for a custom oral appliance. And study after study does show that a custom oral appliance and an internet um, over-the-counter boil and bite is, is not anything alike. Uh, so just because a patient has tried maybe one over the um, from Amazon doesn't mean that they won't get accustomed to um, one that we make. So the way that we make one is, um, since you are a technology podcast, we actually scan rather than traditional goop impressions. We scan with an um, oral scanner, the teeth, and we take a starting bite. And what I mean by starting bite is that we gently posture the jaw forward in a comfortable position. And then with an uh, a, a appliance that is milled, it's, it's high tech as well, it's milled out from those scans, um, we can uh, adjust the appliance forward as needed. So we adjust it forward and then we always do another um, at-home sleep test to make sure that it's effective. Um, in saying that, we start out about 60% of the patient's range of motion, and the muscles adapt really nicely. You'd be surprised. Um, so TMD or TMJ issues is not really an issue. Uh, there can be maybe some initial soreness. If if there is, it's, it's pretty minor. I say it's like going back to the gym, you know. Um, 
and especially right now, like I couldn't touch my toes if I tried, but if I went to yoga and stretched and, and worked at it, my muscles would eventually adapt. And so that's kind of how that works too. If there is any soreness at all, some people get relief from their, of their TMJ with, with treatment, because if they're bruxing and clenching because of their airway, if we treat the airway, oftentimes they're not bruxing or clenching anymore. And so a lot of those TMJ symptoms diminish. The biggest yeah. side effect that I talk about and the one that um, I kind of hit home with every patient is the possibility of um, a bite shift. And it's not the teeth moving because the teeth don't move. It's retainer-like. But the muscles are like, ooh, I like this position. I think I'm going to stay here. And so in the morning when you wake up, you'll kind of feel like your bite feels a little bit off. And I wear an appliance. I chew gum for five minutes and the bite goes back to place. And some people, it might take an hour to get back into place. And then in rare cases, it's about 17% of the time, the bite doesn't fully come back. And it's not like the patient looks like a bulldog. Um, they don't miss any meals. It's just that the bite isn't what it used to be. And most people's bites aren't perfect to begin with. And so whenever I tell them, you know, your bite's off a little bit, you can go to CPAP and we can get that back. And they're like, no, no way. You're not getting rid of my appliance. I love it. Um, the bite change doesn't bother me. So we just, that's, again, it's like um, the bite being a little bit off or oxygen and, and feeling better. So it's a trade-off, and most patients are willing to take it. Okay. Is the oral appliance supposed to be a permanent thing, or is there a way to train the muscles of the tongue and the throat and the jaw to uh, keep this new position or a better, you know, can you do, I guess, myofunctional therapy or other exercises to help someone without the yeah, appliance? Yeah, that's, that's another great question. So really, I, it's not curative. So wearing the appliance doesn't necessarily cure you. It is kind of... you. You know, like eyeglasses doesn't make your eyesight better. Um, but saying that their weight loss can help, it can diminish the severity. Uh, I, it doesn't always get rid of the apnea, though. So it's important to make sure that you retest yourself if you do lose weight. But that is very beneficial. A lot of the patients I treat don't have weight to lose because they're thin as it is, and that's not what is what's contributing. So to be curative, it depends on the case. Um, but there are some surgeries, um, weight loss, and we do uh, suggest it with every patient upper airway exercises to help strengthen the upper airway and help help bring back muscle tone to to um, help airway. However, it the cure rate of it, you know, because you're kind of relying on compliance, and it's it helps diminish the severity, but doesn't necessarily cure it. And so we kind of look at all the factors that are contributing to the sleep apnea. Um, so myofunctional therapy, again, will help you during the daytime and maybe diminish severity, but not, not necessarily curative. Uh, also playing the didgeridoo or double, uh, double reed instruments. That would be like some alto sax or oboe something or other. <laughs> Can help okay. break the upper airway. Huh. I mean, oh, well, I mean, that's, I don't know if most people are going to play the didgeridoo and do circular breathing. I know. I got, uh, it's such a well, beautiful instrument. Well, yeah, I remember I, I got one when my daughter was really little and she would frown and she didn't like it, you know. And now at dinner time, I torture my kids because I, I put didgeridoo music on sometimes and they like, God, <laughs> stop it. But so beyond that, you know, I don't really play that's it. Funny. Um, so when you when you prescribe an oral appliance, you have one made. Do you also give the person exercises and other things to do, or you say just here's the appliance, use it, and that's it? <laughs> no, uh, we certainly do follow ups and you know educate on how to advance it and what to do if you know they have any soreness or need adjustments or whatever. But we do give them the exercises and. and you know, not to overwhelm them. We're like, just pick two a day and you can switch them up. We also do talk a lot about um, adjunctive treatments. Our goal is to get every patient breathing through their nose. And there's several, several reasons for that. But, you know, if you have nasal breathing, you do, you can um, lower your sleep apnea because essentially it's like a longer tube. So you have less collapsing. Also, we 
store nitric oxide in our sinuses. So if we're breathing through our nose, we get better filtered air. That's what the nose is for. And we get oxygen that's filled with nitric oxide, which helps better oxygenation of the blood. And it helps stimulate parasympathetic activity versus that fight or flight or sympathetic, where if your body has apnea at night, it is releasing cortisol all night long, trying to, mm. to fight to keep your airway open and get your body oxygen because oxygen is the number one drug our body needs. And so we, we work on nasal breathing. Uh, we work on increasing strength in the upper airway. We also discuss weight loss. We discuss positional therapy. Um, and that is side sleeping because with an appliance, you can sleep in any position you want. You're not stuck on your back. And um, we, see, we see lower sleep apnea events on um, a patient's side. So it's, okay. it's a combination. It's not just a magic bullet, but we really do want to help the patient get better. And, you know, it's really hard to lose weight when you feel like crap and you're pumping your body full of cortisol, there's, there's a lot more oh, yes. to that, but uh, for, as far as weight loss and that's, that's probably who I, I feel like I'm treating um, a lot of nowadays is people that can't lose weight, even though they're following everything. And it's because their body isn't resting. You're, they're not getting into their deep sleep at night. And that is where hormones such as leptin, that tells us when we're full and Garolyn tells us when we're hungry. It's where our blood sugars regulate. It's where um, the cortisol is not released. And people that have untreated sleep apnea actually crave higher carbohydrate foods because that is our energy source. That's an energy source for a fatigued body. And so when we, when we can treat them with an appliance, I, that's where we kind of really encourage, now that you're feeling better, this is your window of opportunity to change your lifestyle. And people look at me, I, I am in the right BMI range and they say, Oh, easy for you to say. I'm like, actually I lost 30 pounds myself. And so it was, you know, I'm like, I don't want you to lose 50 pounds. Just give me five, you know, just those small changes, those small steps that will keep encouraging them to, you know, not have to drastically change their lifestyle. Cause it's, you know, you get the yo-yo dieting. I just want little small changes so that you can feel a difference and, you know, continue to, to achieve that. So that's kind of the things we do. We, we want to be more than just an appliance maker. We really do like to help treat okay. the whole body. Well, just a couple of quick questions. What about non-sleep apnea dentistry? Um, uh, you know, what, I don't know if you do them or not, but braces, do they do the right thing for the mouth or do they, you know, smush it back and down and cause more yeah. problems? Yeah. So orthodontists are are becoming more aware of airway. Um, so, but we just have better mechanics and better um, materials now, where we can encourage growth. And so we really don't see teeth getting extracted anymore. Um, there are some orthodontists that claim that they can cure apnea and um, by you know expanding the the arches. That is not a hundred percent. We could probably see improvement. Um, I don't. I wouldn't claim that it cures it because we just don't know. Um, but we, it could certainly make room, more room for the tongue and increase airway space. Also, um, we, ha we really want to get to the kids. And so if we can help expand and grow children um, earlier, then we can maybe prevent adult apneic. And what I mean by that is we talk to two-year-olds, three-year-olds, um, parents in finger sucking, thumb sucking, mouth breathing, snoring, grinding, all those same things in kids. We have some solutions now that'll help train their tongue and relieve the stress on the airway and open it up so that they can get proper growth and development. ADHD, um, I truly believe, has origins in airway. And before you medicate a kid for ADHD, then I would, I would evaluate the airway first. We see kids get better in school, better behavior, uh, better concentration, better growth, better eating, um, breathing. Just overall, it's just it's so rewarding to be able to help these patients. Yeah, I've heard. I mean, one one person told me they said they think a majority of uh, ADHD cases are because of a lack of proper sleep, which is amazing. Yep. 
Yeah, their their nervous systems aren't developed yet. So if you think about it, like I'm the super smart mom that when we when my kids were younger and we traveled across the country to New York to visit my in-laws, I'm like, I'm going to give my kids Benadryl so they'll sleep. Yeah, I had one sleep, but one was just running up and down the aisle. Like their nervous systems are not developed yet. And so kids tend to get wired when they're tired. And so even though they're getting the proper quantity or amount of sleep, oftentimes they're not getting the proper depth of sleep and quality sleep. So if your kid um, still wets the bed later on, even after they're potty trained, or um, seems restless in their sleep, like the sheets are messed up in the morning, most parents don't know how the kids sleep. And so what we send them home with is a questionnaire and say, you know what, just for three nights, watch them for 20 minutes and see if you see any of these things. And that has um, really opened the eyes of a lot of parents. And so the treatment that we do is um, we evaluate tonsils and adenoids, um, but mostly train the, the patient to breathe through their nose. And sometimes the tonsils and adenoids can shrink with proper um, breathing, but getting into that better deep sleep with proper growth and development of the jaws. Are there any um, tweaks that you can do you know, on kids or even on adults, you know, when you look at their mouth or, you know, let's say they've got a tooth or two that is a bit crowded or turned the wrong way, or is there such a thing as like a three tooth braces, you know, that'll just try to oh. anchor the two teeth on one side of a tooth and just try to fix it to do, you know, very minor corrections that would help the person with their structure and their function? Yeah, you know, that would give them straighter teeth for cosmetics, but it probably wouldn't do enough so essentially the minimum amount that we do is from canine to canine on the front teeth. So there's times where, yeah, it's just one tooth that's rotated that's sticking out that really bothers them. Um, instead of having metal braces for two years, we can certainly straighten that. Um, not every dentist does that, but we happen to provide that in my office. But uh, for the most part, that's not going to, I don't think it's going to affect their airway, but it'll give them a more confident smile. Okay. You know, I just wondered if there's like smaller interventions that could be done to, you know, to help someone to optimize their, their airway or at least prevent their, their jaw from going in the wrong direction or growing the right direction, or, you know, fully yeah, coming and out. If you and, really uh, want to, if you really want to help, because the tongue is, is the most powerful um, dictator of growth and development. So if you can get uh, the tongue trained, to sit in the roof of the mouth and your jaw to not be hanging down. Uh, we, we can identify mouth breathers as children and adults because their palate or the hard palate, the upper jaw is vaulted. It should be broad and flat. In, if it's vaulted, that crowds the nasal um, airway, but it also constricts the arches, so there's not enough room for the tongue. And that suture in the palate, in the hard palate, closes um, rock hard at about like nine or 10. And so that's why we really want to get to the kids younger. So if we can get the child breathing through their nose and it could be adenoids and tonsils that is preventing them. So we recommend getting those out. If we can retrain them to breathe through the nose with myofunctional therapy and some other um, things that we have them wear at night, then let's get the kids their tongue. That's the best thing to do to ensure proper growth and development. That's why it's so important to get to mouth breathers younger because it can dictate their entire adult future. Okay. So what's the best way for um, people to get in touch with you? I know you can't you know, serve the whole world, but you do travel and lecture. <laughs> so how can, how can people learn more about what we talk about and apply it to their own situation or their family situation? Well, I am on social media. So it's Aaron Elliott DDS. So Elliot is two L's, two T's, and two D's, uh, and that's Instagram and Facebook. But also, my email address is pretty easy to remember, and I will go ahead and get and hand that out uh, just because I love interest and in, and excitement over this. So Aaron Elliot DDS at gmail dot com. Okay, that's great, well, Aaron. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, 
and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.